Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Meeplus and this is Literally Graphic. And a couple of months ago, living through a worldwide pandemic reminded me that I had kind of played with the idea of reading and reviewing Why the Last Man, Volume 1, Issues 1 through 5, written by Brian K. Vaughn, with covers by J.G. Jones, pencils by Pia Guerra, inks by Jose Marzan Jr., colors by Pamela Rambo, letters by Clem Robbins, and editing by Heidi McDonald and Steve Bunch. As far as warning, warnings go, Vertigo is obviously a, quote, adult label, so they're swearing violence, transphobia, death, and very brief and really mediocre nudity. I don't know. 99.9% .9 of men die, and women are generally cranky and miserable. What could go wrong? So, diving into the author bio piece, I should probably start out by warning you all that I am not really a huge fan of Mr. Vaughn's work. I don't feel like he's bad, but some of the stuff he had to say when Paper Girls was coming out rubbed me the wrong way, so here we are. I should probably repost or re-review that series at some point. If these two series are anything to go off, his characterization of female-identified characters has improved from 2003 to 2016. Otherwise, Brian was born in Cleveland and shared a love of Peter, Peter David's 12 run on The Incredible Hulk with his older brother. And according to Wikipedia, he also cites Joss Whedon as the reason he wanted to become a writer. Not the reason I probably don't like him very much. He's best known for his run on Saga, Paper Girls, and Runaways. He's also won 14 Eisner Awards and 14 Harvey Awards. Digging in, Pia Guara is not only credited for the pencils, but is also credited as the co-creator of the series. She has also worked on Doctor Who, The New Yorker, Mad Magazine, and The Nib. She has been nominated for both the Hugo and the Predu Scenario Awards and won Harvey, Joe Schuster, Eisner, and Spike TV Awards. Clicking through Comixology, Clem Robbins has been described as follows. Robbins has lettered for every major and a lot of minor publishers since 1977. His studio, Mongo Unlimited, uses over 100 exclusive custom-designed fonts. Mongo has been the developer of a type technology enabling the use of over 1,500 alternate characters per font, enabling the studio to produce digital lettering that is virtually indistinguishable from hand lettering. Past projects include 100 Bullets, Hellboy, Loveless, Why the Last Man, Faker, VPRD, and The Secret. Previous credits include nearly every comic book ever published by anybody. Hmm. According to Wikipedia, Heidi McDonald acted as an editor at both DC Comics Vertigo imprint and Disney Adventures, as well as some smaller titles. She is also apparently the founder of The Beat back in 2004. Starting out as an intern at Marvel Comics at the age of 16, according to his website, Jose Marzan Jr. has worked with DC Comics, CrossGen, and Disney Comics. Credited on such titles as Doctor Strange, The Silver Surfer, G.I. Joe, Marvel Comics Presents, Robert, Roger Rabbit, Time Masters, The Justice League of America, The Flash, Action Comics featuring Superman, The Adventures of Superman, Jack of Fables, and The House of Mystery. Circling back to Wikipedia, J.G. Jones made his debut into comics in 1994 by drawing Dark Dominion for Defiant Comics. Since then, among other things, he was the artist on the six-issue limited series Villains United, written by Gail Simone. He's also worked with Grant Morrison on the Marvel Boy limited series and Wonder Woman, The Hicketia by Greg Rucka. According to her website, Pamela Rambo graduated in 1989 from the Art Institute of Dallas and has worked at Dark Horse, DC Comics, and Vertigo, apparently also doing some coloring on Preacher. Steve Bunch is perhaps the most mysterious of the lot, with apparently lots of random blogs and 
YouTube appearances. He's listed on Comics Vine as editor or other on Hunter, The Age of Magic, The Filth, Girls Bravo, and Outlaw Nation. The Goodreads description of this book is, Why is none other than unemployed escape artist Yorick Brown? His father was a Shakespeare buff, and he's seemingly the only male human left alive after a mysterious plague kills all Y-chromosome carriers on Earth. But why are he and his faithful companions, the often testy male monkey Ampersand, still alive? He sets out to find the answer and his girlfriend while running from angry female Republicans, now running the government, Amazon wannabes that include his own sister, seemingly brainwashed, and other threats. The Vertigo team of Brian K. Vaughn, Pia Guerra, and Jose Marzan Jr. have given us a great read! Exclamation point. Digging into the art of this volume, as I said initially, this is a very proficient and technically fine book, despite a mistake where I thought people changed up a lot. There was a very consistent team on the comic. Personally, I feel that for a vertical title, so far, my initial impression is it's a bit, tad bit bland visually, not bad, and very accessible, but yeah. As far as different intersectionalities being explored in this first volume, gender was obviously a huge focus, and well, this sort of focus generally means that readers get to learn more about the subject matter with Why the Last Man. This focus only means the reader gets to learn more about the honestly stupid way the patriarchy were writing, quote, women in the early 2000s. Although some people have been holding on to this trend ever since, it does appear as if Vaughn has moved on a bit. I'm less familiar with what Pia has been up to since. TLDR! Trans women aren't real women and died. Trans men are killed for being fake. Straight women are angry, sad, with many of them congregating at the Washington Monument, and lesbians are just angry at the straight women being the least bit sad. A premise that has gotten significantly less interesting to me with time. I originally rated this book three stars in 2008. I'm holding on to a tiny bit of hope that we will get more shades of gray as the series goes on, because so far things are so black and white and falls back on reactionary views that gender boils down to your assumed role in reproduction at your birth. Survivors don't miss the people they lost, they just miss the part of them that the Washington Monument reminds them of. And when Yorick is discovered, 99.9% .9 of the discourse around him is how he can or cannot be used to reproduce, with a dash of sexual pressure, pleasure thrown in. The only good woman and the only woman that Yorick wants to reproduce with is his girlfriend, Someone we last saw trekking across land stolen from the cliché, quote, dead Indian, whose ass goes front and center to show us who this book is still written for, people who want to objectify the bodies of presumed cis women. Sexuality, as I already touched on, was also not super well presented. Everything super black and white, you either miss men because you're straight or you're angry at that other women miss men because you are a lesbian. I don't remember there being any bi or pans, etc. sexuality presented. While this is generally a book where no one is really a quote good person, I would say that in this first volume at least, that rather than the people who died really being the ones critiqued, which is generally what get rid of all quote men narratives are about, Anything that falls outside of the hetero cisgender patriarchy have been the ultimate losers so far via their death in the mystery plague, murder, or because they have so far been set forth as the flattest bad people of them all. Race isn't a total monolith. There's a black woman who is now in charge of ferrying York around. There's also a contingent of Israeli forces because they make everyone join the army! I mean, I guess in 2003 things were a lot more limited to people who did not present as cis men in the military, but that doesn't mean no one else knew how to do military stuff. Neither class or disability felt, uh, felt like things that really came up. I'm actually a bit torn on the star rating for this book. 
I had sort of planned on rating it two stars. It's okay. But the sheer weariness that has overcome me in the writing of this review, I really just don't like this book. So one star it is. Bye y'all and resist white supremacy. And as always, Literally Graphic is recorded on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the Anishinaabe people, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the huron Wendat Nation. I live here because of British colonization, indigenous genocide, and more geographically specific, Treaty 13, also known as the Toronto Purchase, which was finalized in 1805 between representatives of the Crown and certain Mississauga peoples. This treaty was a lie and has since been broken many times over. Saying so reflects only my own small steps towards knowing the truth and does nothing for reconciliation.